That was a scene from the most successful film ever made. Star Wars has already taken $431 million at the box office. And in an industry where every new production seems to outdo the one before, Star Wars remains the all-time winner. What may surprise you more is that Star Wars was made in Britain. It's one of a large number of American movie projects financed with American money, but filmed here in Britain. We start our new series of The Risk Business with an investigation of why several of the world's most successful films are made in Britain, why the profits those films make don't come back to Britain, and why films like that may not be made here for very much longer. Every film project is a major risk, but in the hope of identifying the elements which make up a multi-million dollar box office smash, We've been following the shooting in Britain of the film tipped to be the biggest runaway success of the year, the sequel to Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. In the studios at Elstree, just north of London, we've been watching Chewbacca, Princess Leia, Han Solo and the others making the film whose launch, the cinema world, is now awaiting at fever pitch. And we've been learning what differences there are when you shoot a major film with a British rather than a Hollywood technician. Han Solo. Ah, uh, and he drinks more tea. C-3PO. Well, you get marvellous results here, and it's surprising that uh, more isn't done here. But Luke Skywalker. That, it's, it's almost the same, except with British accents. Action! But whatever the stars, Harrison Ford, Anthony Daniels, and Mark Hamill think, the men who turn their adventures into film are in no doubt that making a big-budget movie on a British film stage with a British crew can make very good sense. Their producer, Gary Kurtz. Oh, I'm very happy. They are as well-trained as anyone in the world, and the crew that we selected for Star Wars and that we have working on Empire couldn't be better, I don't think. And their director, Irvin Kirshner. The technicians I'm working with now are extraordinary. They're willing, they're able, uh, and they're highly motivated. They, I think, like the picture they're working on, and I find it very easy to communicate. Uh, fortunately, they speak English, or what it passes for English in my country, and uh, it's been a good experience. The arrival of the Americans at Elstree has meant much more than simply jobs for people who make films. This is Han Solo's spaceship, the Millennium Falcon. Surprisingly, perhaps, they managed to make Star Wars with just small sections of this craft. But for the sequel, they've built the complete thing. And the actual job of construction went to a firm of heavy engineers in South Wales, far more used to servicing the North Sea oil industry than the film business. It was a contract worth 70,000 pounds. And on top of work for British industry, big time movie making has given Elstree a new giant sound stage. Built by the Star Wars team, this new 600,000 pounds facility is now a British asset, with Darth Vader and the rest having first call on using it. And for the moment, things are looking just as healthy in less glamorous corners of the British film industry. American projects are also providing a good deal of work at Bray Studios near Windsor. 
These Missen huts, once the home of the Hammer Horrors, are now the headquarters of some of the film world's most respected special effects men. Nick Alder was one of the men who helped ensure Superman was magic, Alien was terrifying. Making American productions has recently meant very regular business for Britain. As well as Luke Skywalker, James Bond, Superman, Flash Gordon and Alien are only a few of the international heroes and villains put onto celluloid by British technicians on British stages. But regular work does not mean regular profit. That goes to whoever backs the film. If the Empire lives up to expectations, this British-made film will gross a further $400 million for its American producers. American Business in the box offices of the world is booming at the moment. An American population bulge is now in its late teens, anxious to spend its evenings out of the house, swelling the queues at the local picture palaces. Not since the very different times of the 30s, the golden days of Hollywood, have theatres been so busy. Never have movie budgets been so big, and rarely have studios like those of 20th Century Fox been so full. At Hollywood's height, the major studios controlled the entire industry. They owned the stages and the lots on which the films were made. They controlled the stars who appeared in them, the men who staffed the production teams. They handled the distribution and the marketing. And most important of all, perhaps, they owned the cinemas. So what was taken at the box office belonged exclusively to them. Antitrust legislation broke Hollywood's monopoly of the American cinema business, but other factors too have brought a dramatic change in how the film industry now works. The slump in box office receipts of the 40s and 50s exposed the weakness of these integrated production centers. Both in Hollywood and later in Britain, studios turned to television production. Many went to the wall. Those that survived found very hard times. The revival of the cinema in the 60s and 70s has seen the birth of a new kind of industry power structure. The key figure in today's film business belongs to no studio. The new breed of producer works independently, seeking stories, organizing money to finance the filming of them. The producer of Star Wars is Gary Kurtz. From start to completion, he's the one who carries the can. I think that's right, yes. I mean, it's our responsibility to do the best job we possibly can uh, and present it to the audience. If the audience accepts it, or enough of a segment of the audience accepts it, well, then, then we've done a good job. If they don't, well, we haven't. And that's really the bottom line. A producer with a story needs a director, a man who will turn that story into film. Now, he is likely to be offered a fee plus a percentage of any profits. Director for the Empire is Irvin Kirshner. That share of the action is a strong incentive to stay within budget. I think you, uh, you must uh, be aware of the economics of the business. Um, being sloppy can cost a million dollars. Um, not taking, uh, not doing your homework can cost a million dollars. Um, being wasteful can cost two or three million dollars. One guarantee of at least some interest at the box office is the inclusion in our package of a star or two. Untypically, the original Star Wars succeeded with a largely unknown cast, like Anthony Daniels, who plays C-3PO. But this time round, he too is on a percentage of the profits. It's a film like this that can subsidize work in rep, for instance, for me. Although, were I to go to the RSC and say, uh, you know, I've just been playing uh, C-3PO in Star Wars. I don't think they'd be terribly impressed. Uh, you see, a lot of people didn't realize there was anybody inside 3PO. And when they did, they didn't realize it was an actor. And when they realized it was an actor, they didn't always realize it was me. So. And that's one of the magic things, that the human beings talk to 3PO as though he's quite human. They certainly do. Tony Daniels, thank you very much. Tony Daniels as 3PO. He was one of the characters that was wonderfully funny in the screenplay, but I never sort of imagined him as sort of a fuss-budget English valet. The sort of the Hudson of the droid world. <laughs> Once the stars and the director are on the verge of signing contracts, our producer has to move fast to raise the money which will pay for the project. Usually, 
The bulk of that will come from the organization which will ultimately distribute the finished film to cinemas and exhibitors. This is today's role for the erstwhile kings of Hollywood, the Warner Brothers, Paramounts and Universals. But they have to be convinced. Star Wars was turned down by two major distributors before the then chief at 20th Century Fox, Alan Ladd Jr., took the risk of backing it. One of Ladd's successors, Richard Berger, remembers what an act of faith it was. I happened to be looking back on the proposal the other day for Star Wars, and it was for $5 million. And that was 1976, I guess. So that was a substantial sum. And we went forward with it. The budget, they'd gone over budget several million dollars, and I think that they were asking for two more million. And the board was very nervous about this. They, they didn't quite understand what a Wookiee was and what R2-D2 is and all these people you know, that have become so famous now. And uh, there was a meeting in New York, and Alan Ladd was present, and they said, why are we doing this? Should we be expending this type of money? And Laddie, who was a very low-keyed, soft-spoken individual, just looked at the board and said, yes, we should, because I think it's the best movie ever made. And that was what he said, that's the truth, and the rest is history. $431 million at the box office, $12 million apiece to the producers. A lucrative piece of cinema history at that. The technicians who actually made the film saw none of those profits. The sound men, the camera operators, the lighting crew, the scene hands, they had no percentage of the profits, they had no slice of the action, and neither had those technicians most important for a space adventure, the special effects men. The team who, with a colored ball, a critically positioned camera, and a beam of light, create on film an impression of travel through the universe. Long after the current vogue for space adventures is past, there's going to be a call for the special effects skills which made all this possible. The question is whether it will be British technicians who provide those skills. Here at Bray, I can fly in my spaceship thanks to nothing more than a moulded background, a few flashing lights, and a picture of the spacecraft painted on a sheet of glass. The stars, the planets, are each added on later passes of the film through the camera. The real secret lies in extremely careful positioning of lighting and camera. But the latest generation of this sort of equipment gives the director more freedom because it allows the camera to move, each position being carefully controlled by a computer. That equipment is being developed in America. And that means the future of British special effects is now right in the firing line. Star Wars may have shot their live action at Elstree. They shot their special effects in California. British equipment was just not up to the job. Good though Britain's reputation may be today, Nick Alder believes time is running out. If we're not careful, we're going to fall really very, very heavily behind unless somebody starts to invest some money and keep us up to date. If a big British investor was prepared to put money into you, how much are you looking for? Um, as a complete setup, I would probably think something in the region of 100, 150,000 pounds. And that would, we would actually be able to be completely operational with that. What sort of return would you offer on that? Um, I would think possibly, well, in actual fact, if it was one large picture, one large picture could pay for the whole thing, which could be done in 12 months you would actually have paid that investment off and started making profit. The alarming truth now facing all British film technicians is that it's not just special effects which are losing their international appeal. American companies who regularly shoot in British studios are now finding making films here is becoming too expensive. At 20th Century Fox, Richard Berger is in charge of production in Europe. We did uh, Alien in England and that was... Um, that was an eight and a half million dollar budget, and the pound was at a dollar ninety at that time. 
the pound at 225 now uh, would add a million and a half to that budget. That's a lot of money. 20th Century Fox finances some 12 major films every year. If Richard Berger can't see cost savings in shooting some of them in Britain, will he continue to use our studios? I can't give you that guarantee. I don't know. Uh, I think as, as everything shifts, uh, there probably will be a slackening of American productions going over to, to England. The signs are clear. Don't rely on foreign work to keep you employed. But if Britain has a respectable lineup of technical talent, how could we set about using it to make successful films of our own? How did Star Wars producers George Lucas and Gary Kurtz get their project started? Both George Lucas and I uh, felt that we wanted to see a space adventure movie in the tradition of Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. That there hadn't been one in a long time. And it was just a, seemed like a good idea for a project. The next step was figuring out whether it was economically feasible to do it, whether we could get the special effects technicians, whether we could find enough stage space, whether we could convince a studio that that type of project was really worthwhile. And it took a long time to do that because everyone was very skeptical. The science fiction films had not made money in the recent past. Finally, 20th Century Fox backed the producer's faith in the project, knowing that this is always a better bet than following market research. That's absolutely true. Uh, I know, for example, we, we did two low-budget films uh, two years ago. Uh, one didn't work at all. And I think, going in, we suspected that that might be the more commercial film. It, it, was, it just didn't work well, for a lot of reasons. What was the subject? Uh, bowling, which we thought was certainly... Uh, there are 100 million bowlers out there, and we did one of these... Here's how you sit down and you say, 100 million bowlers, 10%, that's 10 million people. You can't lose with this. We'll get them out. They're more interested in bowling than going out to see a movie about bowling. And maybe the movie could have been better, too. On the other hand, we had a little film about bike racing and about a kid who wanted to be an Italian. And it's called Breaking Away. And I can't, to do this day, explain in a short, you know, two sentence, two sentences, what that movie's really about. Except when you see it, you love it. Breaking Away, which has already taken $20 million in America alone, was produced and directed by an Englishman, Peter Yates. Alien was directed by Ridley Scott, an Englishman. Midnight Express, produced by David Putnam, directed by Alan Parker, both Englishmen. Yanks directed by John Schlesinger, an Englishman. It is no lack of talent that dogs the British film business. It is a lack of finance which drives that talent into the arms of American, German, French and Arab backers, all of whom have realized, like Richard Berger, backing a movie is not the risk it used to be. You don't just look to the, to the theaters to bring our investment back. There are other avenues now. Uh, the cable television, which is paid television, which is expanding quite rapidly, the cassettes, the video discs, all these things are starting to make uh, the risk less of a risk because you can get certain guarantees. For instance, I know CBS bought Amityville Horror for a million eight. If they had to go out in the marketplace today to buy that film, that film would cost them 10, 12 million dollars. So they're always interested to look at the pre-sales, uh, and if it's a good package and it's an interesting script, Anybody can walk in. What makes good box office? A well-made film. I think that's the simplest answer. Uh, it, it is hard to say. If, if I knew that answer, uh, we wouldn't have... If we make ten films, probably eight of those films are not going to be successful. That's the ratio. Uh, hopefully, of the two that are, you'll get one that's a breakthrough, like a Star Wars, an alien. Uh, and that covers you, that covers you, your basis. As I was talking before, those other eights that don't really make money, they don't lose that much now because of this backstop through the cassettes, through the cable, through television. And not just television here in the United States, what's happening abroad is those markets are really opening up a great deal and they're paying top dollar. It would be quite wrong to give the impression that British financiers never back big movie projects. 
or that the lessons of spreading the risk are not being learnt. For instance, the investors who back the film of Watership Down are putting up the money for their next project, which will be a portfolio of eight films. What's more, they've raised 80% of the production costs by pre-sales and television network deals. But those films may not all be made in Britain, and to be a commercial success, they will have to be targeted at the North American, not the home cinema audience. Our researchers for this programme suggest that a filmmaker who looks to the British cinema alone for his success cannot today afford to spend more than a million pounds on his movie because even a smash hit here, just 4% of the world market, will never justify higher production costs. But in the international market, he probably can't afford to spend less than £10 million to have a hope of success in a world where you may not always win, but you no longer have to lose your shirt. When it comes to understanding the way Britain can fit into the international film scene today, one organisation is really setting the pace. On the north side of Hollywood's Ventura Boulevard stands a new building. Here, amongst the savings banks and attorneys at law, are the headquarters of associated film distributors. Gentlemen, we're here today to discuss the two most important projects we have on the docket. Senior Vice President Leo Greenfield is carrying the battle for British profit right into the enemy front line. His associates are Barry Laurie, Vice President in charge of advertising, Fred Mound, Vice President in charge of distribution, and advertising and publicity assistant Don Barrett. Together, they present a new voice for the British film industry. About how many theatres do you envision we would play simultaneously on June the 20th and hope to keep running? We can open in approximately 600 houses that will run... The picture they're discussing is an American-made pop musical with American stars and an American producer. Only the money from EMI is British. One of their plans is to open Can't Stop the Music in 600 cinemas on the same night. We retained the services of a featurette crew and made a rather interesting, hopefully it'll be interesting, one-hour special for television syndication. The Blitzkrieg launch campaign will center round a one-hour television special, which AFD will give free to as many television stations as can be persuaded to take it. In return, the stations must undertake not to plug the movie, but to promote their own television program based on the movie. Plug the movie. You can assume that if we get into the top, what, uh, 100 markets? With? With a syndicated show? How many least, should... Yeah, it'll be at least the top 100 markets. Top 100 markets. You may pick up, the, by means of the television special, a million dollars worth of television advertising for the movie. How do we simultaneously reach all of the people in the areas of the 600 theaters. In other words, we have to hit them with an enormous impact immediately. Radio will play a very, very key role because you can get into the teens, you can get into that 15 to 24 year old, the television reaches a much broader audience. So radio will play an extremely important mix along with television. In addition to that, we will be going into teen magazines that zero in on the teen idols, uh, the tiger beats of the world that are in the States. So, a television special will be backed by television advertising, radio promotion, and teen magazine features. British-backed Can't Stop the Music will be sold anywhere the theme will have appeal. Even the name of the producer will be used as a marketing aid. It's the movie musical event of the 80s from Alan Carr, who brought you Grease, starring Village People, Valerie Perrine, Bruce Jenner, Steve Gutenberg, and Paul Sand. And I'm sure you find many ways to understand they're they're singing YMCA which was YMCA, their biggest yeah that was their biggest hit YMCA I love it AFD is an American company owned by two British production houses Lord Delphont's EMI and his brother Lord Grade's ITC both know they can't ignore North America whose cinemas are now 50% of the world market what succeeds here tends to succeed everywhere else as well. But films only work in America if they're marketed aggressively. And that costs money. What do you think that Associated Films distribution budget will be on all advertising media that we will actually have to spend? 
I think I'll leave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me write this. Uh, uh, no less than four and a half million and up to six and a half million. And that would be almost half what the movie itself cost to make. Exhibitors generally are 20 years behind the times. They perceived the Muppets to be a group of rag dolls. The Muppet movie, which we handled, was the eighth highest grossing film in 1979 in the United States and Canada. In fact, if Lord Grade's next epic, Raise the Titanic, is the success he believes it will be, setting up AFD in Hollywood will have cost him less than he would have to have paid an American distributor anyway. Running a check on the complete North American top 10 for last year reveals two interesting details. First of all, a surprisingly large British involvement in the success of Hollywood. And second, how important it is for those who risk their money backing films also to control their United States distribution. A major success in North America could see the lion's share of the profits going not to the original backer, but to the American distributor. The tenth most successful film of last year was actually a British production from EMI. The Deer Hunter paid back $27 million to the risk takers who backed it. But thanks to a deal with the American distribution company Universal, EMI actually ended up with just a couple of million dollars of that. Christ, five million cigarettes. I murder on the lungs. Oh. Number nine, a totally American production. California Suite paid its backers $29 million. Moving right along in search of good times and good news With good friends you can't lose This could become a habit Then came the Muppet movie, the American-made but British-backed success. Kermit and the gang paid back Lord Grade and his team $32 million. Moving right along Moonraker was number seven, net takings $34 million. Though shot largely in Europe, with British stars, a British producer, and British director, the financial backing was American, and that's where the profits stayed. The next two successes were both all American deals. Star Trek The Motion Picture produced $35 million for its backers. The Amityville Horror, another $35 million earner. Number four, Alien. Its American backers received $40 million. Although it was made by a British director from a British script, and was filmed over 40 weeks at Shepperton Studios with 36 more at Bray, Hollywood took the profit. Rocky II, an all-American film, made $43 million and reached third place in the ratings. Every which way but lose you turn me Every which way but lose Clint Eastwood and All American Friends took number two. $48 million came back from Every Which Way But Loose. But far and away the most successful film of the year was Superman. What the? Oh, Superman! Gee! Stand back, please. Stand back. It's all right. That's what you're worried about. $81 million was the payback to American Warner Brothers from this epic adventure. Yet, Superman was filmed in Britain over a two and a half year period at Pinewood, plus three months at Shepparton. What's more, the award-winning special effects team who made the whole film possible was also British. Total takings, $404 million. Takings for British companies, a mere $35 million. And contained in those figures is the real message of tonight's program. British financed product in the American market creating profit mainly for the Americans. American product made here in Britain, again, creating profit for the Americans. International movie making is a tough game. And what's more, 
we can't even count in Britain on the Americans continuing to bring their work here. However, in this profitable business, there are signs that Britain is learning some of the rules. But in the end, no matter how good the script, how successful the pre-sales and the marketing, there is always the risk your picture will flop. When The Empire Strikes Back opens next month, will the audiences who marvelled at Star Wars find that the stream of space adventure lookalikes which have followed have now made us tired of the whole business? I think the worst thing in this business is to follow the trends. And I think you chase a trend and you lose. Uh, there's one exception, and that's Star Wars. The exhibitors tell me, the ones who, who show the films, that uh, there's no surefire success. The, the distributors say there certainly is no surefire success. The producers have long since told me that no surefire success. The worst risk it would be spraining my ankle. I one could end film. up being the Fonz of space. There have been a lot of science fiction films all through uh, the history of movies. Some have been really good and some have been terrible. But the elements that make them good, I think, are the characterizations. The space hardware that we have and the special effects are as good as we can possibly do them. But you could have a whole movie full of great special effects and people would fall asleep. It's very doubtful that it will equal the intensity of the impact. I think it's sort of all blown out in that one big one. And all the others that come along, whether it's in our series or anything to do with fantasy or science fiction, will never be that big. But uh, I think this is the one. This is the one that people are going to look at and say either terrific, when's the next one, or nice try, too bad you didn't make it. Next month, everyone will know what that verdict is. But tonight, as the British film industry asks itself whether making profits for foreigners is the best it can now expect, we can remind ourselves of what that industry is capable of producing. For the first time on British television, the Empire Strikes Back. The Force is with you, young Skywalker. But you are not a Jedi yet. <laughs> <laughs> 